Zanzibar, the spice island of the Indian Ocean. The very name evokes romance and adventure of swashbuckling sailors and fabulous sultans, of pure white beaches and clove gardens. A small island on the east coast of Africa which is intimately linked with the great Indian Ocean voyages of the past when Arab Taos called on its ports to carry away its aromatic spices. Zanzibar's economy has always been linked to the sea. The sea is also very close to the hearts of the Bugis of Indonesia, at the other extreme of the Indian Ocean from Zanzibar. Sailing the high seas is a centuries-old tradition for these hardy people, and to this day they ply the thousands of islands in the Indonesian archipelago, carrying cargo in old-style vessels. The Sunda Kelapa Harbour in Jakarta may not draw modern liners today, but it has a proud, unbroken history. After the arrival of the Europeans in the 15th century, Sunda Kelapa changed from being a small fishing harbour to the centre of the spice trade. Around it grew the city of Batavia, which eventually became modern Jakarta. Halfway between these two places lies the southern Indian state of Kerala, whose fishing communities have been going out to sea for centuries. The sea is a way of life here, and often boats venture across the Pak Straits to neighboring Sri Lanka, carrying their cargo of fruits and vegetables. All these diverse people and cultures are inexorably tied to each other. For centuries, they traveled to each other's lands, traded and even intermarried. The colorful intermingling of races and ethnicities produced what can be called the community of the Indian Ocean. The ocean has long been a highway linking a variety of peoples, cultures and economies. And now, a new initiative has begun to build bridges of cooperation based on these historical ties. The Indian Ocean is the eastern boundary of the African continent, reaches out to the Middle East via the Persian Gulf, washes the shores of the Indian subcontinent and links up with the South China Seas. It carries half of the world's container ships, one third of bulk cargo traffic and two thirds of the world's oil shipments. The Indian Ocean is the lifeline of the world's trade and economy and has been so since time immemorial. By the beginning of this millennium, there was thriving trade between many of the kingdoms and states bordering the littoral. Though trade underpinned the complex relationships of the early voyagers, there was a lot of exchange of culture. From as back as the first century AD, there is a, uh, a Greek account of the East African coast, of the Indian Ocean as a whole. But talking about the East African coast itself, talks of Arab captains coming to East Africa understanding the, and speaking the language of the local people, intermarrying with them. And that has been going on for the remaining 2,000 years uh, until today. The result has been that um, all around the Indian Ocean, you find communities or port towns which look very similar. The steamers spoke a kind of a language. They could communicate in. It was a kind of a pigeon language. And one which was understood only by the traders and by the seamen. That was one impact. Then there is an interchange of technologies. Uh, as you know, the Arab ship, which is called the Boom, was very often constructed in India because of the availability of good quality teak. The Arab boat was a cultural vehicle. This hybrid product has sailed the oceans for centuries without much change in its basic design. It was made with Indian timber and almost certainly acquired embellishments taken from other parts of the Indian Ocean and perhaps even Europe. The sea is part of local law and culture in the Persian Gulf, 
celebrated in legend and song. In the tiny fishing village of Sur on the east coast of Oman, the association with the oceans is close. Old sailors recall the days when they used to sail regularly to the ports of Basra, Bombay, and then to East Africa, carrying textiles and timber to barter. Aya Basra, ye lakri, pashnega, pakrega, kaju, malbibar, aw hum, pakrega, guya, India, Mumbai. أحمد بن ماجد هو من استطاع فاسكو دي جاما اثناء اكتشافه للطريق التجاره في الهند استعان بالبحار العمانيين منهم احمد بن ماجد المشهور بشهاب الدين احمد بن ماجد اسد البحار هو الذي دل احمد بن ماجد فاسكو دي جاما بالطريق الى الهند وعبره استطاع فاسكو دي جاما الوصول الى الهند وكان بمثابه حادثه كبيره للتجاره العالميه واستطاعت اوروبا عبرها ان تتعامل تجاريا مع الهند وهذا الفضل يرجع الى العرب So proud are the Omanis of their maritime history that they claim that Vasco da Gama, who was the first recorded European to reach India via the Cape of Good Hope, took the help of an Omani pilot, Ibn Majid. The Europeans, especially the Spanish and the Portuguese, set out in the 15th century to discover the sea route to the east, where untold riches awaited them the jewels of Arabia and the fabled spices of the East Indies. An expedition led by the Portuguese Vasco da Gama succeeded in reaching Calicut in 1498, where he was welcomed by the ruler, the Zamorin. Vasco da Gama returned to Portugal with tales about the opportunities for trade. He was fascinated by the beauty of the land and died in Cochin, where his remains were buried for a short while. Other Europeans followed and discovered that many Indian Ocean lands were linked by a flourishing maritime system which served markets far and wide. This trade was developed further by the Arabs. And it was from the Arab, you might say, that the Portuguese took over and expanded the trade to some extent further. Of course, the Portuguese attitude was very different. They, for the first time, tried to create monopolies. They tried to monopolize the spice trade. The Dutch, the French, and the English followed the Portuguese, setting up companies which slowly established control over the economies of many Indian Ocean countries. From Indonesia to Mauritius, from India to East Africa, territories began falling to the colonizers who wanted monopolies over precious raw materials. In 1507, the Portuguese took control of Muscat and other towns in Oman, building forts which watched over the sea routes to the east. The Portuguese fought the English in the marshy islands that were to become Bombay, and the Dutch went to war with the Portuguese in East Asia. The English clashed with the French in India and elsewhere, and it was apparent that the administrators of these countries were ready to use the might of the state for their commercial interests. In 1760, a French minister declared, it is colonies, trade, and in consequence, sea power, 
which must determine the balance of power in Europe. The traders had become the rulers, and the colonies became a source of not only minerals and spices, but also cheap labor. During the 18th century, thousands of slaves came from the mainland of Africa on their way to Europe and the colonies. This underground dungeon in Zanzibar is a grim reminder of the evil of slavery. When slavery was abolished, the colonizers collected indentured labor from India and China and shipped them to South Africa, Mauritius and other colonies in their thousands. The trading communities of the Indian Ocean were no match for the newcomers, with the result that trade within the ocean countries began to dwindle and their goods were exported to their colonial masters. The golden age of Indian Ocean trade was coming to an end. However, it was by no means over. Cultural and commercial interaction continued among the people of the Indian Ocean throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, producing fascinating racial and social mixes. One example of that cultural amalgam is Zanzibar. The island got its reputation as a spice center from the clove, which came to its shores from Indonesia via Mauritius. Other ocean communities also found their way to Zanzibar. It was ruled for nearly two centuries by a succession of Omani sultans and attracted Arab and Indian merchants who settled down there, bringing their own culture and lifestyle. If you walk around the, the stone town, you can really get the history of, uh, of uh, at least a couple of centuries of uh, Indian Ocean history. Many of the Indians who came here tended to buy some of the existing Arab buildings, but then they added their own features, which they like. One prominent thing, of course, is uh, the, the balconies, the verandas in these very narrow streets. You find many of the houses would have uh, a balcony overhanging the street. All along the ocean's littoral can be found such examples of racial integration. tiny Reunion Island is home to descendants of former slaves. Neighboring Mauritius and South Africa have large populations of Indian origin, the great-grandchildren of indentured laborers. Gujarati traders settled in Oman several generations ago and people of Arab descent live in modern Indonesia. There are other common historical legacies too very visible in the architecture of coastal towns. The Neo-Victorian City Hall of Durban. A hotel in Colombo. Dutch colonial style buildings of Jakarta. All reminders of a bygone era, of history which is not pleasant, but is still history. Colonialism is yet another link that binds the countries of the Indian Ocean. Next year, as far as Mauritius is concerned, we shall be celebrating, as far as we are concerned, the 400th anniversary of the landing of the Dutch here. Because that also is history. You know, Mauritius, for a long time, was administered by the Dutch from now Jakarta, then Batavia. And then the, the responsibility for administer, administrating Mauritius was shifted to the Cape. So oh, this is shared history again. Not, all, not always pleasant, but history is, is history. It is the Portuguese who tried to create monopolies, who tried to create a military domination. Nevertheless, despite the presence of the Portuguese Navy and their superior armaments, the Indian traders, or I might say the Asian traders, because we might include the Arabs, the Javanese, the Malays, who all took active interest in the trade. They were not displaced, not till the middle of the 18th century. It was only with the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and the effect of European political control over India 
and they just control over Indonesia that what you might say, the colonial pattern, that is to say, of raw materials going outside and finished goods coming to India, it begins at that time. With such historical ties, it is only natural that there should be an attempt to once again rekindle the associations of the past in order to create a firm basis for the future. As the world began to change a few years ago, the idea of the Indian Ocean Rim was born, an initiative of developing economies bound by history and with a common vision of South-South cooperation. It was an idea waiting to happen and struck a chord all across the ocean. A few years back, uh, people here in Mauritius, but also in South Africa and in India, came to realize that whereas regional initiatives or even organizations, associations were developing all over the world, in and around the Indian Ocean there was no such initiative on. So something got started. It's, it began with seven countries meeting, then it developed into 14 countries. It began as an initiative, an initiative aimed at getting together all the countries in and on the rim of the Indian Ocean, some 25, 30 countries, depending on the criteria you use. So it started small, but it has already become quite a big, not only initiative, because the initiative has now become an organization. The Indian Ocean Rim Initiative has become the Indian Ocean Rim Association for Regional uh, Cooperation. This is really a, uh, an idea whose time has come because uh, uh, various factors in the past have prevented this, uh, the formation of such a uh, grouping. But now, of course, the world has changed in a dramatic and a fundamental way. And uh, especially uh, those countries involved around the rim, uh, the Indian Ocean rim, so I think uh, this is really uh, an exciting uh, uh, venture uh, which Indonesia fully subscribes. And of course, it is at this stage uh, economic uh, driven. Um, it has uh, economic cooperation as its main goal. Uh, we do not for, for, uh, preclude eventually to also talk about some political cooperation, but as of now, the Charter speaks of economic cooperation. This has been a hub for maritime commerce and comings and goings. The Arab traders used to come. So we are a very organic part of the Indian Ocean. We see it like that, and our history uh, developed along those lines. Now, in the early 70s, we had the Indian Ocean Peace Zone Initiative, which was Madame Bandaranaika's uh, personal initiative when she was Prime Minister. Of course, that was very... Um, oriented towards uh, security. It was in the time of the Cold War. Now times have changed and um, the IOPZ is, I think, uh, being phased out. Uh, it can't go on for very much uh, longer. Now, therefore, it is very logical for us uh, to get involved, to be interested and concerned about the uh, Indian Ocean Rim Association. This idea has its roots in the notion of Afro-Asian solidarity spelt out by Jawaharlal Nehru long ago and endorsed by many former colonies. But it was not till the 1990s, with the Cold War coming to an end, that a new era of regionalism and economic cooperation began emerging. The idea of a regional bloc among nations on the Indian Ocean littoral was once again revived and its first public proponent was Pik Botha then the foreign minister of white-ruled South Africa. You see, at that stage, uh, South Africa was already moving into, into the world more freely uh, because we had by then, you know, made major and dramatic moves on the whole issue of the independence of Namibia and India, amongst others. Uh, was one of the countries who received me with, uh, with warmth and friendship. The past was already receding into the past. Uh, and uh, it struck me with, with your huge population uh, that, uh, that surely here was a chance 
if only we could uh, if only we could put the vision together for the Indian Ocean Rim countries to come to some pact, some agreement with one another based on their resources. The idea should be seen in the context of uh, global trade liberalization, which has been accompanied by the formation of regional economic blocks in various parts of the world. And in the early 1990s, uh, particularly with political change about to take place in South Africa, a number of uh, politicians, particularly in India, Australia, and South Africa, started talking about the possibility of an Indian Ocean regional grouping. Uh, the realization being that uh, the political impediment uh, would be removed by the achievement of uh, majority rule, uh, democracy in South Africa. This was no utopian vision, but one based on sound economic reasoning. Despite accounting for 31% of the world's population, the Indian Ocean region contributes less than 11% of global trade. Intra-trade among regions is low, and most goods find their way to Europe and North America. This is despite the fact that these countries boast of enormous natural, financial, and human resources. These synergies can be leveraged to generate tremendous value addition and wealth to create a growth multiplier effect for the 1.6 billion people who live in these countries. This is the grand vision behind the RIM idea. I can only say that uh, I am quite convinced, and I've discussed this uh, with, uh, with our mineral uh, experts, in this country, in the mineral field in particular, uh, you have enough synergy in the mineral area to do what I, am, uh, what I am preaching and advocating. I'm not even talking of the agricultural sec sector. Of course there is it. The, the northern legs, I said, have the people. They have the, the hungry people, but they have the soils. There is the fertilizer. We, we need the investments and a plan. Now we can look at investment into India and uh, market around the Indian Ocean Rim and beyond the Indian Ocean Rim, using the Rim to reach into Central Asia, into China, uh, from uh, South Asia into Asia Pacific, from South Asia into West Asia. So what it does, I believe, is that it buttresses all the links that were there. It excites new thinking, new perceptions about movement within the region. And so investment at one point would trigger off ripples and waves that will reach to the other points of, of the rim. Uh, this block has everything it has, it, 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 it wants, in fact, from population to the economic uh, backgrounds, economic sectors, industry, uh, trades, whatever. So, Oman, of course, we are a very small nation with regard to the other countries like India or like Australia, partners. But uh, no harm in doing that, because to be part of that block, it is a win-win situation. Oman will win, the others will win, which is quite fair. Take one uh, concrete example, um, quality control, standardization. In fact, Sri Lanka has offered to host uh, a meeting of the 14 countries on standardization. Now, that's a good, practical, day-to-day -day subject, devoid of theory, and a uh, good start to get 14 countries marching uh, in step on a question like that. In 1995, a core group of seven countries, known as the M7, came together in Mauritius for an intergovernmental meeting. These were South Africa, India, Oman, Kenya, Mauritius, Singapore, and Australia. Subsequently, seven more joined the grouping. Madagascar, Mozambique, Tanzania, Yemen, Sri Lanka, Malaysia and Indonesia. It took two years to plan and coordinate the association process and in March 1997 foreign ministers of the 14 member countries met in Mauritius to adopt the Charter of the Association. The Charter clearly indicates that the IOR ARC seeks to build and expand understanding and mutually beneficial cooperation through a consensus-based evolutionary and non-intrusive approach. The Charter explicitly excludes bilateral and other issues likely to create controversy. It was agreed that 
political, security, controversial issues would be kept out of the agenda, or at least for the time being. It was also agreed that uh, uh, trade promotion, trade within, promotion of trade within the, the zone, the Indian Ocean Rim area, would be promoted, but not for the time being, again, at least through tariff reductions. Uh, there was and there is resistance to that line of action, or at least as that now, uh, as I said. I think it is good if, for the time being, we fully concentrate on economic uh, uh, issues and on economic cooperation, because uh, too early uh, discussion of political issues or political uh, cooperation may, uh, may cause difficulties because of the wide divergence of views that we, we may have, you know, among the countries of the region. Um, but I know by experience, I know from experience in Asia and in others, that uh, uh, you cannot avoid. At, at one point, of course, there will be common interests uh, to att attend to, which are political in nature, and on which there is a convergence of views. And then you, you simply, almost naturally, uh, are going to talk about it and, and to discuss it. But as of now, I think uh, the Charter clearly uh, stresses the economic uh, priority. An interesting feature of the association is that all the member countries are also members of other regional blocs, like the South Asian Association of Regional Cooperation or Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Will that in any way conflict with their membership of the IOR ARC? In a sense, it's an overlap of many regional organizations strung together in this beautiful necklace it starts with South Africa, comes all the way to India, and then uh, goes back into, into Australia. So I think it's more a uh, value addition on what is already there, rather than leftovers coming together to say, let's also have something of regional cooperation. Potential for a conflict, and certainly uh, fears of a conflict are there. Uh, and as a result, uh, everyone has decided to move very slowly, one. Two, everyone has decided to move somewhat uh, comprehensively and not to have too large uh, a gathering to begin with. So we sort of are not that sure-footed in the beginning, not knowing how people from several different regions, but combining together in a super region will, will be able to work together. Every one of these 14 is a member of some one or more other groups. That is because today we are living very, very visibly in an era, area of expanding regionalism. Um, more and more regional blocks of different kinds are coming up. I see absolutely nothing wrong with that. I don't see any duplication. I see, on the other hand, an enrichment of the bilateral ties that bind all of us together. You see, when you're a member of two or three groups with other countries, those are uh, bonds that reinforce bilateral relationships. So I do not see, in the first place, regionalism as a kind of uh, threat to good bilateralism. I don't see that. I see it as a strengthening of bilateralism. It has also been pointed out that IOR ARC consists of mainly developing countries with very diverse economies. It includes Asian tigers as well as some other countries which have very low per capita incomes. How will they be able to work together? I think we should uh, put to rest the myth that uh, developing countries cannot trade with one another because they do not have complementary economies. I think we have all grown in different directions sometimes, and there is now much greater complementarity. And so we are eager to see whether in trade, but also in joint ventures and uh, private investments, uh, we can, you know, uh, make this work uh, in a concrete way. As far as disparities are concerned, we will have to use two different theoretical perspectives. One is that of Habakkuk, which says that economies with similar structures, in fact, trade a lot. So we don't always realize that United States and Europe, or more or less accounts for 70 to 80 percent of their investment processes between each other and significant trade. So if there are many countries with lower level of economic development, they are potentially 
interlinked structures for trade. The second theoretical question is, if you have an advanced country and a less developed country, then technology transfer based on endowment provides comparative advantage. We have that in the Indian Ocean Rim. Economic and human resource development have therefore emerged as the key pillars of the association. Each member has something to offer to the other members, and such cooperation can only lead to greater business opportunities. The membership of the RIM has countries like Singapore, which is a financial center, India, which has a large number of technically qualified personnel, South Africa and Australia, which have natural resources, and Oman, which has petroleum and natural gas. Countries like Tanzania have harbors, which can give access to the hinterland of Africa. The port of Colombo is a vital gateway linking the different parts of the rim. These will be the hubs around which the association will function. This will benefit intra-regional investment and technology flows. The IOR arc is not an initiative limited to intergovernmental discussions. Right from the beginning, there has been a determination to give it a wider scope than just trade and investment. And there are three clear tracks to the process, academic, political, and business. What is interesting about this grouping is the structure. Now, this is a tripartite structure involved, as you know. That is, this group is going to operate through three sub-groups, that is, uh, through the businessmen of the RIM Association, there will be a business forum, a permanent business forum, then through the academic communities of the 14 countries and through the governments. During the business forum, whenever we meet, there are other countries' members who always come with the new ideas, with the new projects. Uh, for India, for instance, I mean, at the beginning of the, of the Indian Ocean Rim Conference, they brought uh, several projects, Australia, for instance. So, Oman is one of the active member countries, as I mentioned. Oh, so uh, I think if we start, this will help not only Oman, but I am sure it will help the all member countries in the area. We do have, as you know, a multifaceted approach, and that is not only to be a trading arrangement, but also a grouping where we have not only businessmen acting independently, which helps the trading part, but also academics. Because we also recognize at an early stage that we also need to get information about Indian Ocean countries and you know, was shared by those countries. Many countries are quite ignorant uh, of other countries in the southern hemisphere. We all live in an age in which uh, the mass media and the information that we've had uh, provides us with more information in the countries of the south about the northern countries. We know very little about each other. A lacuna felt by almost all the members was the lack of information about each other. Countries in Africa may know very little about the needs of the tiger economies of the Far East and vice versa. Clearly, reliable, up-to-date and instant accessible information is needed to foster cooperation between businessmen of the member countries. This challenging project was taken up by the Delhi-based Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry. FIKI has set up IORnet, a clearinghouse of vital information about member countries which can be accessed by business houses anytime, anywhere. In the long run, thousands of companies from the 14 member countries will be listed on the network. If you take the, suppose, the, suppose the Indian Ocean Rim Net now, which is which basic, based on uh, in uh, India, we make use of that net. You know. That's one of the th ba basic things now, all the materials that we can, come from, we can bring from there. We have got access to them, so it is easy. This is the one of the, of the main idea now. Now we are doing a study which, been, which should be done by us and the South, of South Africa. Uh, because, you know, we have got 10 projects in the whole Indian Ocean Rim. Uh, some of the projects being taken by us. This, this is what we call the maritime uh, transport and ports upgradings, insurance and reinsurance. IORnet is just one of the several projects launched by the RIM Association. Ports all over the ocean are a vital part of the process of development, and their upgradation is among the projects of the Indian Ocean RIM Association. One such is Durban Port, the largest in Africa, which handles over one million containers a year. The port is a gateway to landlocked countries in the region and is now gearing up to fully integrate 
with the rest of the Indian Ocean community. I think Durban will certainly take advantage, particularly from the, the view that uh, we are looking to position Durban as a transshipment port. So as that will act as a bridge for moving goods to and from richer countries to poorer countries or vice versa. And that transshipment business, we're already seeing quite a significant growth. In fact, that's one of our uh, rapidly, rapid growth areas at the moment. Already, uh, we provide uh, import-export routes into landlocked countries such as uh, Zambia, uh, Zimbabwe, um, even as far as Zaire these days. Um, and uh, we are looking to, uh, to Tanzania in these countries. So we certainly see that we will uh, uh, continue to and in improve on our uh, uh, landside communication facilities between Durban and these landlocked countries to allow them access to uh, the benefits and prosperity of participating in the Indian Ocean Rim Initiative. What is now needed is governmental action by way of policies and legislation which will take away some of the anomalies that can be seen in intra-regional trade currently. These arose mainly because of traditional trade flows and lack of contact among many member countries. What business will do, in fact has started doing, is asking for specific policy directions of the government which will in effect promote business. For example, today if you are to send a container from Bombay to Mauritius, it is cheaper to send it via Singapore and then to Mauritius, which is absurd. Uh, we are finding, for example, that <clears throat> some of our exports that go to India go via European countries. So the trade figures will show a high trade relationship with a northern country, but not accurately reflect the relationship with India. And this is partly because of, uh, you know, old links that were established. So once we reorient that, then the trading figures will also reflect more accurately. This is just a small area. Exploitation of marine resources, technology transfers, tourism, training. The list of areas for mutual cooperation among members is long. In this era of regional cooperation, IOR ARC could emerge as a potent force and already the world has taken note of the emergence of this block. Many applications have been received to join the IOR ARC, including from countries like France, whose presence in the Indian Ocean is by way of tiny Reunion Island. But though membership is open to all sovereign states of the Indian Ocean Rim, a decision has been taken not to add new members till at least 1999. The compromise worked out in Mauritius was this, that we would set up a committee of senior officials to go into criteria. We are, we are adopting the approach that uh, it's better to have a set of criteria and then apply them to individual cases rather than dealing with each application for membership ad hoc. That struck me and many everybody else as being a sensible approach. So these criteria will be drawn up and then we will see. There are obviously going to be one or two difficult cases which will have to be argued as to the connection with the rim. Uh, the statement of principle in the charter is very simple, that everybody, all countries situated on the rim are uh, eligible for membership. And subject, of course, to their complying with certain conditions laid down. One of them is, for instance, that, um, that um, most favoured nation treatment should be extended by each to all. And there are a few other matters of that kind. So let us see how this goes. I reckon that uh, by the time the next meeting comes up, the next meeting is in two years' time, it's going to be in Mozambique. Um, we should know where we stand on membership. There are a number of applications for membership. Um, I, from recollection, I would say some seven or eight. Already two countries have asked to become members. Uh, and their membership does, full membership does raise, a, present a problem in terms of uh, geographical criteria. One is Egypt, very friendly country to Mauritius, to India and to the others. But the fact is if we say yes to full membership to Egypt, where do we stop? Because for example, Mauritius is in SADC, Southern African Development Community, and quite a number of our fellow members like Zimbabwe, say, okay, we're not on the rim, but we are not on, we, we use Maputo, which is the only harbor we use, and, and therefore we should be on board. Therefore, if we say yes to Egypt, where will that lead us? Where do we stop? The second 
interesting uh, membership uh, request is from France. France, as we know, is a sovereign country. And France argues that through the island of Réunion, next door to Mauritius, which is a constitutionally a department of France like any other department, like Paris or any other department, therefore they say they qualify and they've put in a request for full membership. Now, as you know, Mauritius has excellent privileged relations with, uh, with France. Uh, so it is not certainly that Mauritius is going to say no, not at all. But uh, it does raise, uh, it, does, uh, it does pose a problem. Uh, we believe that regional cooperative uh, schemes, regional cooperative uh, forums should be inclusive rather than exclusive. And therefore, as a general principle, we believe that uh, all countries uh, of the Indian Ocean, both in the rim as well as within the ocean, expands itself, or to be members. Uh, the Charter also provides for that. However, uh, we of course also realize that uh, uh, we must uh, pro uh, proceed in a pragmatic way and in an evolutionary way. We cannot just open up uh, uh, and thus perhaps at the very early stages, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, sacrifice efficiency and efficacy in our operation. So we believe that uh, we should not, you know, immediately expand uh, without limits. However, we do believe that the present membership, 14, uh, still offers uh, scope for a further expansion of some countries around the, around the region. Nobody is excluded. There is no discrimination. There is no uh, preferential treatment. It is just that you arrived at a broad formulation of who begins, who should be the next in, and who should be finally in uh, at, the, at the last stage. And I think that's worked reasonably well. There were some reservations and doubts initially, but I think it's worked reasonably well. For us, I think it's important that we shouldn't give the impression, and indeed we shouldn't actually be thinking of excluding anyone because uh, we believe that they have in some other way been inimical to us or they haven't been overtly friendly or that they have an agenda uh, which may not be entirely to our liking. I think you're moving into a vigorously new age and a new arrangement and a new opportunity and a new platform. And I think India can afford to be a little more generous and certainly be afford to be a little more confident of its own place. The Indian Ocean Rim at the state level <coughs> is restricted to certain members and it's been doubled now to 14 and we will I hope go by stages to increase that. So that is at the state level. But that does not stop the initiatives of the business community to actually participate in projects with countries that are not members at a state level because we wish to encourage that kind of cooperation. These are very early days for an association which is poised to become a significant example of regional cooperation. But more than business and investment, the Indian Ocean Rim Association is about a community of people linked together by history as much by geography and about the retrieval of that common heritage. For India, which has a long coastline, and for many other countries which have historic and economic links with this vast ocean, the emerging association of regional cooperation has tremendous significance. But most importantly, the association is about people coming together. The Indian Ocean was and will always be a spectrum of cultures and traditions, colors and costumes, races and religions. All of these lived and worked in harmony for centuries. There is no reason why they cannot do so again in the future. <laughs>